Welcome back and now for the news in detail. We begin our bulletin from the UK, which has officially left the European Union after 47 years of membership, over three years after voting in a referendum. In a tweet, Prime Minister Boris Johnson promised to bring the country together and take it forward. More in this report. Three, two, one. The flags outside embassies have been lowered and the countdown clocks have stopped. The United Kingdom is no longer a member of the European Union. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson marked the historic moment with his team at Downing Street office. Brexiteers celebrated the day, claiming victory and calling it Independence Day. Something that I fought for for 27 years and something that many thousands of you gave your time, love and money for. We faced an establishment that never even wanted to listen us. An establishment that never wanted that referendum to take place. An establishment that has tried for three and a half years to frustrate the will of the greatest democratic mandate ever seen in this country. Brexit has exposed deep divisions in British society with many fearing the consequences of ending long and complicated ties with the nearest neighbours. Some pro-European protested the development with candlelit vigils. It's just an overwhelming sense of sadness really. I mean, yes, I'm, I'm disappointed to some extent because I was pro, I'm still pro-EU and I'd hope that, well, something could have changed in the, the years since the referendum. And obviously that hasn't materialised, but um, yeah, at the moment it's just sadness and um, Seeing the UK leave is, yeah, it's just sad, really, really sad. The European Union's leaders say they will defend the bloc's interests in upcoming negotiations with the UK. President Charles Michel, David Sassoli and Ursula von der Leyen sent their good wishes to the country. They also pointed out that Britain will no longer enjoy the same benefits as EU member states. We want to have the best possible relationship with the United Kingdom, but it will never be as good as membership. Our experience has taught us that, that strength does not lie in splendid isolation, but in our unique union. Britons voted to leave the European Union in a referendum in 2016. Moving on to China, where the death toll from the Wuhan coronavirus has risen to 259. Health officials say nearly 12,000 people have been infected by the virus. More in this report. The U.S. has declared coronavirus a national health emergency and imposed a quarantine. All major U.S. airlines have canceled flights to mainland China. Australia's Qantas Airways said the entry restrictions imposed by the U.S. have also forced it to suspend its flight to China from February 9th. The center of the epidemic, China's Hubei province remains under virtual quarantine, with roads sealed off and public transport shut down. Officials say the local government is stepping up efforts to ensure continued medical and market supplies in Wuhan. Our medical staff are also in shortage. As the number of patients increase, there is an increasing demand for our medical staff. But the shortage also has eased to some extent as medical teams, including those from the Chinese People's Liberation Army, continued to arrive in support of us. Yesterday, the UK also confirmed its first two cases of the coronavirus after World Health Organization declared the outbreak a global emergency. In Egypt, the Arab League is holding an emergency meeting in Cairo to discuss Washington's plan for the Middle East. The meeting was held on the request of Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. The plan, which declares Jerusalem, Israel's undivided capital, was unveiled by President Donald Trump last week. But Palestine rejected the move as a political circus. Abbas has urged the Arab nations to take a clear stance against the proposal. 
The U.S. has warned Palestine against opposing President Trump's Middle East peace plan at the United Nations. Trump's plan gives Israel a green light to annex key parts to the occupied West Bank. The U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Kelly Croft, says taking up the case at the world body will only repeat the failed pattern of the last seven decades. Palestine's President Mahmoud Abbas will speak on the scheme at the UN Security Council in the next two weeks. UN envoy Riyadh Mansour said Palestine hopes the UNSC will vote on a draft resolution on the issue. Muslim states and most European countries have rejected Trump's deal, calling it unacceptable. Israeli warplanes have bombed multiple locations in the Gaza Strip. The Israeli Defense Ministry says the aircraft struck Hamas's posts in retaliation to rocket fire. It said two rockets from the Gaza Strip headed for settlements were intercepted in the air. No casualties have been reported. Earlier, the Israeli military said it had launched a wide-scale attack on militant targets in the Gaza Strip. The attacks came amid heightened tensions after U.S. President Donald Trump released his Middle East peace plan. Israeli forces have wounded 50 Palestinians protesting against U.S. President Donald Trump's Middle East peace plan. Palestine Red Crescent Society said Israeli forces fired tear gas and rubber bullets in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. It said a total of 13 demonstrators have been hospitalized. Five shells have struck a military base housing U.S. forces in Iraq's northern province of Nineveh. In a statement, the Iraqi military said there were no casualties in the attack. The military said Katyusha rockets landed at the perimeter of al Qayyara Air Base. The attack came a week after thousands of protesters called for a scheduled withdrawal of the U.S. troops from the country. On January 5th, the Iraqi parliament passed a resolution to end the presence of the foreign forces. The U.S. says it will expand its limits on immigration to six more countries. Homeland Security Secretary Chad Wolf said citizens from Nigeria, Eritrea, Sudan, Tanzania, Kyrgyzstan and Myanmar will no longer obtain some types of visas. Speaking to reporters, Wolf said the government will also stop issuing diversity visas to Tanzania and Sudan. Wolf said non-immigrant visas are not affected for these countries. He said a failure to meet U.S. security and information sharing standards led to the ban. Immigrant advocates and right groups have criticized the move, saying it weaponizes immigration law and advance a xenophobic agenda. In 2017, President Donald Trump introduced the travel ban on 12 countries, most of them with Muslim majorities. Meanwhile, the U.S. has eased the travel advisory for Pakistan while acknowledging the security environment in the country has significantly improved. The development comes days after the U.K. eased travel restrictions to the country over the improved security situation. In a statement, the U.S. State Department said there are greater security resources and infrastructure in Pakistan's major cities. Noting the update, Pakistan's foreign office has described the development as a step in the right direction. The Foreign Office said Islamabad has made resolute efforts to enhance security throughout the country. It said the improvement in security has also led the UN to redesignate Islamabad as a family station for its personnel. It said the development offers opportunities for enhanced economic activity and foreign direct investment in Pakistan. In another advancement of Hindutva ideology, India's right-wing leader, Obdesh Rana, has vowed to counter the ongoing sit-in at Shaheen Bagh in the capital New Delhi. The all-women protest has continued against the controversial Citizenship Act since 16th of December. The radical leader said he and his youth brigade will reach Shaheen Bagh on 9th of February. Rana said his organization wants to launch a counter sit-in as they also have women to support them. Meanwhile, the ruling Bharti Janata Party's leader, Sangeet Som, has called for the public execution of Muslim activist Sharjil Imam. Speaking to the media, Som said people like Imam talk about breaking the nation, so they must be shot dead. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has called for real progress in bilateral relations with Belarus. He said this following a meeting in Minsk with Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko. At a joint press appearance with Lukashenko, he said Washington is confident that together with Minsk, they can progress in every dimension of their relationship. Pompeo also said U.S. will appoint an ambassador to Belarus. 
We want to be here. You'll see um, we've, we've built our team uh, diplomatically here uh, by almost a double. We'll, we'll do that again. Uh, we'll have an ambassador here before too long. Lukashenko appreciated Pompeo's visit to Belarus, saying he came to Minsk despite misunderstandings between the two countries. Now, moving on, four people have been killed during a fresh wave of protests in Chile's capital, Santiago. Demonstrations appear to have calmed, but this week has seen a rise in violent protests. Officials say one man died of suffocation after a supermarket was set on fire, while another was shot dead by police. Another man was killed after being hit by a hijacked bus and another after being struck by a policeman. Over 30 people have died in protests that began in October when the government increased metro fares. In Tanzania, 13 people have been killed by flash floods that swept 16 villages in the southern district of Kilwa in the Lindi region. Officials said floods have left 15,000 others homeless and damaged thousands of hectares of farmland. The government has created four centers, sheltering 8,000 homeless people. Officials said remaining 7,096 people were being accommodated by their relatives and friends. Kilwa district has a total of 90 villages. Authorities are counting the laws in the 16 villages to establish the exact number of houses that have been demolished. More well, stories to follow right after a short break. Welcome back. The United Nations Security Council has approved a six-month relaxation of an arms embargo on the Central African Republic. 13 of the Council's 15 members voted for the resolution, with China and Russia abstaining. The resolution allows the Central African Republic to acquire military vehicles after notifying the UN ahead of time. France drafted the resolution, which reimposes the arms embargo at the end of July. China said the resolution did not respect the wishes of the CAR's authorities. Russia's UN envoy, Dmitry Polyansky, said the resolution did not take all the arguments into consideration. The United Nations is looking for ways to scale up its humanitarian aid in response to the recent military escalation in northwest Syria. In a press briefing, the UN General Secretary's spokesperson, Stefan Dujaric, said dozens of civilians have been killed by recent airstrikes and shelling in Idlib. Dujaric said that he regretted many medical facilities have been suspended and their work has also been suspended because of the growing insecurity in the region. He said humanitarian organizations are still trying to organize and support the evacuation of people. The spokesperson said the situation in Idlib is worsening. The UN also urged the warning sites to spare civilians and to help humanitarian activities. UN organization Stabilization Mission in DR Congo has awarded Pakistani female peacekeepers with the medals. This is Pakistan's first female mission to receive any UN award for its services. In a statement, the mission said the officers throughout their deployment worked hard to win the trust of the community. Fifteen female officers, including majors and captains, were honored in a ceremony in South Kivu region. The officers are psychologists, stress counselors, gender advisors, doctors, nurses, information officers and logistics officers. Another team of 17 women will join the mission this month. Indonesia has conferred its highest military award upon Pakistan's Naval Chief Admiral Zafar Mahmood Abbasi. The award has been given in recognition of the Naval Chief's services for strengthening ties between the naval forces of the two countries. During his visit to Jakarta, he also held meetings with Indonesia's Deputy Defense Minister and other officials. The defense officials of the two countries discussed matters for further expanding cooperation between the two forces. In Uruguay, a local company has come up with an innovative idea to clean up a historical seaside resort. The organization is encouraging people to collect, clean and compact plastic in exchange for a virtual currency that gives them discounts. More than this report. Plastic is one of the biggest environmental concerns of our era. Now, several countries are working to remove plastic trash from their beaches. 
A company in Uruguay is encouraging the local community to take on the plastic menace by offering incentives to collect plastic, by giving people a virtual currency in exchange for plastic collected from the beach. Users deposit the collected waste and start accumulating the virtual currency. Plasticoin is an incentive system in which users are encouraged to sort their household waste and bring it clean and dry to a collection center and exchange it for a virtual currency that gives them discounts or benefits or products from member companies. The minimum deposit is one kilogram of plastic, which is worth 100 plastic coins. Plastic removed from the beach gets 200 plastic coins and 400 from our microplastic. The plastic coins can be exchanged with discount vouchers. The user is the first link in the recycling chain. Let him be aware of his plastic consumption and the damage it generates. So they say, well, I am collaborating with this. And it is not that they are collaborating, because we are rewarding them with the benefit. In a way, we are paying them to do it. The project's goal is to clean a historical seaside resort in Uruguay's coast. It has been well received by the local community. The company has reached nearly 1,000 users within two weeks. I was looking for something to entertain myself and suddenly I saw the page. Started reading and showed it to my mother. And my mother liked the idea, so we started to collect plastic. The project was just launched in early January, and in a show of appreciation, a government agency has also contributed $5,000 to the cause. And now the weather situation from Arandok. That's all for now for the latest updates. You can follow us on social media at Indus.news.